So finally, in this part of the symposium, I'll, I will give an overview of the SFP Advanced Computational Design, which is a four-year program funded by the Austrian Science Fund, FWF, since March 2020, and which has become kind of the backbone of the GCD research in these recent years. So, and after this overview, members of the ACT will show some of the current results. And you are, of course, also invited to go again to the exhibition to get hands-on experience with our research, as you have probably already have done. So, in this project, we want to fundamentally change uh, the area of architecture, engineering and construction. This field has an enormous impact on the society and the environment, but unfortunately, it currently lacks uh, computational design tools to face some upcoming challenges. So let me elaborate on this. So AEC has an enormous impact on the way we live, especially in times of extreme urban growth and limited resources. For example, the city of Vienna is forecast to grow by a size equivalent to the city of San Francisco in the next 30 years. There is already some flagship projects that show how architecture could use renewable materials like timber or biocomposites or include the environment directly in our buildings to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. Using innovative design ideas, AEC can improve the, also can improve the living conditions and environments we grow up in or where we learn and study and where we work. Uh, but also in our recreation, for example, in cultural activities or in sports. So this is a particularly beautiful example, but you have seen many others in the pre presentations before already, how the future could look like lightweight constructions with resource-friendly materials. So why is architecture like this not more common? Well, innovative design requires the collaboration of many different stakeholders. And this is currently very costly and difficult and only done for a flagship project at enormous cost. And furthermore, uh, the results are usually only prototypes and the insights from them are usually not reusable or generalizable because they are not really based on basic research. So why are projects like this uh, so expensive? So we believe that the reason is that there's a lack of computational tools, especially for collaboration in the early design phase, uh, which could help to reduce fragmentation. In fact, if we look at digitization of different sectors, construction resides at the very bottom of this list, right next to agriculture and hunting. Therefore, this sector faces stagnation, uh, stagnating productivity and innovation. And as a result, while we face these challenges like urban growth and scarcity of resources, the vast majority of architecture and construction still uses conventional processes uh, and standard wasteful materials like concrete, causing a huge ecological impact. Uh, the obvious solution to this problems, uh, problem is to create digital design tools for the early design phase uh, using the field of, uh, uh, of information uh, uh, of ICT. And ICT also has a vibrant research tradition. Um, however, computer scientists developing these tools often lack domain knowledge leading to suboptimal solutions. And therefore, our overall vision in this project is to bridge the gap between AC and ICT through basic research uh, in a multi- and interdisciplinary fashion. Um, so we want to create advanced computational design tools, hence the name, and processes that bring disciplines together and improve the quality and, and efficiency of AC, and not only for flagship projects, but also for a much wider audience. But what concrete design tools do we focus on in this project? So I would like to explain this on the key design tasks in a concrete example, the Expo Building 2012, developed uh, by our PI, uh, PPIs uh, Stefan Hutzinger and Christina Schinecker with Knippers, uh, uh, Elbig Advanced Engineering and so on. So the first step in the construction of such a big project is to sketch design at intents. This step has currently no connection to computational tools. And then more concrete geometric ideas are synthesized in concept models and often through a tedious process of many iterations. Here, for example, using NURBS models and then 3D printed. 
The next st step is the geometric design or form finding through optimization. And the concrete discretization of the form is determined, separa determined separately without feedback to the form finding process. Lighting design has an essential impact on the functionality and atmosphere of buildings, but it is only done when the geometry is fixed, more or less in a trial and error fun uh, fashion. At this stage, it becomes interesting to show prototypes to designers and users, but this requires high effort because light, geometry, and haptics need to be considered, so many different representation forms are required, like one-to-one -one -one mockups, small models, and visualizations. Virtual reality could do all of this at once, especially if it could also provide haptic feedback. Transformable designs are currently only implemented as an afterthought because they are so hard to simulate. While they could be incorporated as essential elements already as the, of, for the functionality of a facade. Also, the mechanical material behavior is only considered after the design process in many cases. But materials like composites require awareness of material behavior already in the early design phase. This is an important gap since green composites offer new potentials for lightweight high performance structures. And finally, the physical realization of a building currently requires a huge effort and material, often manufacturing the building twice. And a research into less wasteful materialization strategies is necessary uh, that exploit the geometry of that building. All these design steps are currently done sequentially without feedback and often lacking computational tools. And we, in this project, propose new computational design tools for these steps, but not in an isolated way, but tied together. So we structure these topics into three areas. Design methodology, visual and haptic design interaction, and form finding. And these areas collaborate on basic research for the early design phase. And to achieve this, we require also a multidisciplinary team. Fortunately, we can, rely, uh, we can build on the existing collaboration in the form of the Center for, uh, for Geometry and Computational Design, uh, which was founded in 2014 here at TUV, and including researchers well known in their disciplines. For this project, we opted to go beyond the GCD as well um, and extended it with knowledge in architectural design and material experimentation provided by University of Innsbruck and TU Graz. In total, the project encompasses four faculties, computer science, mathematics, civil engineering and architecture. So now let me discuss some details of the individual sub-projects. In area one, design methodology, Subproject sub 2 links the simulation subprojects to the early design phase. It's a very central subproject. It does so on the one hand through a sketch based mixed reality design interaction tool. You can see in this example how a wall for a theater stage is designed, and the user can interact uh, with different aspects of the design, for example, lighting, discretization, transformation, etc. On the other hand, Subproject 2 will develop digital ontologies to formalize the domain knowledge so that early designers can interact with digital tools from the different domains. Subproject 3 develops a new workflow for intuitive concept modeling using implicit design knowledge. Here you can see how explicit knowledge in the form of constraints uh, as well as implicit knowledge in the form of a 2D image are given as input. And then using transfer learning, a machine learning approach, the system retrieves a 3D point cloud that ad adheres to both the constraints and the example design, along to move away from iterative NURBS modeling. In area two, visual and haptic design interaction, subproject four, uh, investigates novel lighting design workflows. Instead of manually adding luminaires using rules of thumb as an afterthought, we develop algorithms uh, that can place lights already in the early design phase, both automatically following design constraints as well as interactively and in a kind of guided way. Subproject 5 adds haptic feedback 
uh, to the prototyping tools for the early design phase. So the geometry, lighting, and the haptics of a building can be experienced in one environment. This is done through the innovative use of a robot and considering its safety design and mechanical aspects. Area three covers different aspects of form finding. Subproject six deals with uh, the discretization of surfaces in a cost-effective way and looks at new panel types, including curved, ruled, ban uh, and bending panels in the interaction with the other subprojects. Subproject seven mathematically investigates possible configurations of flexible quad surfaces to allow for transformable design with important effect also for the other subprojects. Subproject 8 introduces the mechanical aspect into the project, in particular the mechanical be behavior of plant-based biocomposites. For this, a multi-scale model links the microstructure of these materials to the structural behavior of the final building. In this way, the material properties can be used directly for form finding for structural design. And finally, computational design tools need to be tested in physical realizations. And therefore, Subproject 9 is dedicated to physical experimentation with form finding with multiple materials. This serves two purposes, testing new algorithmic tools from the other subprojects in practice, and on the other hand, coming up with new ideas to explore mathematically. So in summary, the overall vision of our project is to create advanced computational digital design tools and processes for the early design phase that link design methodology, visual and haptic feedback, and form finding through basic multi- and interdisciplinary research in order to improve the quality and efficiency in architecture, engineering, and construction. And for the rest of this session, David Hahn, our project manager, takes over the moderation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michi. So, hello everyone. Um, for the rest of the session, we'll have four of our PhD candidates who are uh, doing active research in this project present some of the recent results and uh, some of the main ideas that Michi just presented in uh, his introduction. So the first talk will be on, on a mixed reality sketching system by uh, Balint Kovac. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, good afternoon, and welcome to the presentation of the SFB Subproject 2 on MR Sketch, a mixed reality sketching environment for architectural design. My name is Balint Kovac, and I have the privilege to welcome you in the name of our team of committed scientists, ranging in expertise from architecture through structural engineering to computer sciences. Today, we would like to give you an overview about how we aim to improve architectural design by creating new computational tools. We find that one effective way to achieve this is to support informed decision-making from the earliest design stages. Decisions made at an early stage can have a huge impact on the entire architecture, engineering and construction process, or AEC for short. We, in the entire SFB, strive to facilitate informed decision-making from the very beginning of the de design process by exploring novel tools for architectural sketching. First, we'd like to suggest a definition of sketching that goes beyond the most common understanding of drawing lines onto paper. Actually, sketching shouldn't even be associated with a specific technique or mode of expression. Rather, sketching is a process of form finding, a systematic strategy of design. It is more than a means of expression. It is a process of selection and omission, in other words, decision making. Sketching is a means of communication, communi communicating ideas to others, but also an inner dialogue of what is real and what is possible. Sketching, thus, is thinking. Thinking about form, about shape and space. Thinking about conceptual design, 
and its eventual realization. This process of thinking must not be limited by tools. Yet, evaluating certain decisions in a conventional sketching application can prove rather difficult. We propose that a sketching application must support the immediacy and intuitive nature of sketching and the process of informed decision making at the same time. We are developing our sketching application, MR Sketch, with this paradigm in mind. Our goal is to evaluate different interaction modes and computational solutions to find such a balance between unhindered expression and informed decision making. The foundation for this is that our sketching application allows sketching directly into 3D space. Of course, this feature comes with considerable challenges. The user must always be sure how they are situated and where exactly the newly sketched lines will be situated in relation to them and to the previous ones in 3D space. Our proposed solution for this problem is a system of viewport affixed 3D drawing canvas geometries. In this mode, the drawing canvas is locked at a fixed distance from the camera. Brush strokes made by the user on the 2D surface of the screen are projected onto the drawing canvas. At each update, a view ray shot through the tip of the pointer intersects the drawing canvas to add an additional data point to an existing sketch line or to start a new one. The user can quickly adapt to the relation between the canvas and the viewport, making it intuitive to judge where new data points will be positioned in 3D space. To further enhance this notion, we implemented different visualizations of the canvases, such as a transparent grid and a depth-based intersection renderer. The grid helps to understand the shape of the canvas, while the intersection renderer is especially important for precisely connecting sketch lines at desired positions in 3D space. Creating 3D sketches provides very important benefits. Experiencing the sketch immediately in 3D facilitates the understanding of form and spatial extent. Furthermore, we remove the usual step of creating models from freehand sketches by an intermediate step of computer-aided design tools, for example. The sketches created in our app allow immediate data transfer and processing, facilitating the exchange with domain experts at our project partners. This way, immediate feedback can be provided in the earliest design phases, creating informed sketching. Furthermore, we are interested in sketching as a process. Beyond the sequence of 3D coordinates, we also capture the temporal aspect of their creation process. The dynamics of a brush stroke carries information about intent and allows, and allows the exploration of techniques such as style transfer. Observe, for instance, this visualization of stroke dynamics with a heat map as a function of drawing speed. We use adapted, adaptive velocity thresholding and adapted speed constraints in knowledge-based algorithms and adaptive approximations to convert conceptual sketch strokes into suitable B-spline representations. The temporal aspect also plays a role in designing transformable structures and kinetic architecture. You will see some impressive examples from other sub-projects in the following talks. To find the most suitable interaction for these tasks, we explore different mixed reality techniques. Our application features a cross-platform ecosystem incorporating tablets, smartphones, smart boards, virtual and augmented reality devices. Different target devices allow us the evaluation of a broad spectrum of interaction modes. Using portable touchscreen and stylus-based setups facilitates the quick and immediate form-finding experience. Using VR and AR head-mounted displays 
allow multi-view and multi-scale sketch visualiz visualization, contributing to a better perception of form and space. Agendis also allow us to experiment with different six degrees of freedom, track devices, hand tracking, and so on. You can see these ideas in action in, a virtu in some virtual reality environments right here. We employ the spatial mapping capabilities of different target devices, such as the built-in LiDAR scanner of current phones and tablets, to use real, physical, tangible objects as ready-made drawing canvases. With this technique, we can create a spatial mesh from the physical surroundings and use that geometry to project the sketch lines onto. All the techniques that we discussed up until this point are employed to support a central project goal, enabling informed sketching by integrating immediate, real-time domain expert feedback from the very beginning of the architectural design process. We are in an intense, continuous, multidisciplinary collaboration with our partners in the other SFB sub-projects. Different SPs, bringing their expertise from their respective research fields, such as mathematicians, structural engineers, computer scientists, and material scientists, contribute their knowledge to support decision-making in the AEC process. We, in sub-project two, are exploring data exchange and process integration techniques to find out how this knowledge can be brought to the designer. As just one example, we provided a proof of concept implementation of a design workflow where the design space of flexible quad meshes can be explored directly through sketching from the first draft iteration to actual digital manufacturing. It has been made possible by a real-time network data exchange between our sketching application and, cu and custom plugins created by our project partners in Rhino, Grasshopper, and Industry Standard Parametric Design Software. You can observe the same data exchange in a VR environment as well. Data derived from hand tracking allows parameter manipulation with immediate room scale visualization. When designing interactions, user evaluation becomes a central task. Recently, we have evaluated the desktop version of our application with architectural design students. Although the interpretation of the study data is still ongoing, you can see some of the sketches our students have created. Our goal in the SFB sub-project two is to further explore the possibilities of 4D informed mixed reality sketching to create new computational tools to support decision making in the earliest stages of architectural design. After the presentation, we invite you to try out our application in the exhibition and experience the innovation potential that is our SFB for yourselves. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the symposium. Thank you, Valiant. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. If, if anyone has a question for Valiant. Okay. Then we can move on to our next presentation, which will be given by uh, Matthias Bank from the University of Innsbruck. And he will be talking about uh, using point clouds for concept modeling. Oh. Is it this one? All right. Yeah, Matthias. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Matthias, and I welcome you to the presentation of Clouder. Uh, and Clouder is a hybrid environment that aims to provide more immediacy for architectural concept modeling. Uh, the project is being developed by our interdisciplinary research team, which consists of five architects, uh, three mathematicians, and a creative technologist, which you can all see here. And the team is based at the University of Innsbruck and is part of the Advanced Computational Design SFB research project. 
the general focus of our team, computational immediacy, is to investigate and explore new ways of concept modeling in architecture. When we talk about concept models, uh, we mean three or more dimensional architectural ideas that allow us to develop and communicate initial design ideas. Uh, referring to Barlin's earlier lecture, one way to develop initial spatial concepts is to sketch using various 2D media, uh, such as lines, strokes, and shades. Uh, but another traditional sketching method is physical modeling, where 3D objects and materials are composed to develop spatial ideas. In recent years, um, however, 3D sketching has somehow increasingly moved into the digital space. And this is, of course, due to the growing range of digital tools that can inform our models with complexity and immediacy at a very high speed. And this diagram on screen from Matsu's design uh, displays this immense range of digital tools within the architectural profession that we all somehow deal with uh, in designing. But just as the presented sketching app by previously uh, provides a real-time link between a 2D and a 3D environment, our project, Clouder, is looking for new strategies to actually integrate physical modeling within digital modeling workflows and enhancing the immediacy uh, in the design process. Uh, the three main components of the proposed workflow are build, capture, and inform, as you can see here. And through the development of these three components, um, our goal for Clouder is to explore new architectural form-finding methods uh, by establishing these immediate connections between uh, physical and digital design spaces. Uh, as a data medium, or design medium, if you will, uh, between the three components, we utilize point clouds. Uh, on a technical level, it's because of their lightweight representation, where the lack of topological information speeds up the processing and rendering. And on an aesthetic level, uh, the vagueness of a representation provides an open interpretation, which can be beneficial for designers uh, who tend to keep their designs vague and volatile during the concept modeling phase. So, to jump into our first use case, which we named Clouder 1.0, we address the issue of 3D boundary to interior. Here, the users essentially construct physical massing models whose boundaries are captured, then digitized, and later digitally informed with interior properties. Um, there's a lot of noise here, is it me? Okay. Down? Okay. For the build component, uh, Clouder is equipped with different sizes of colored blocks, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, the capturing is done with two Azure Connect devices, which captures a boundary point cloud of the blocks. And uh, the last component, the inform component, uh, uses an outer encoder, in this case, to enhance the captured blocks with interiors. And this outer encoder is developed by our team's mathematicians and it is trained on 3D patterns uh, and structures of point clouds. But somehow, instead of explaining it further, we would like to show it to you, how it works in a video, um, which will start here. So this video gives an overview of the installation Clouder 1.0 that was exhibited at the Potentiale Free exhibition uh, at Out in Innsbruck uh, last year. And the aim of the installation was to test the proposed hybrid modeling workflow and to design together with a neural network through point clouds. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the main components of the installations have a table, it's two connects, it's controllers, and a screen. And uh, during this process, the designer has four different viewing modes to get visual feedback through the, throughout the process. And mode one, as you see here, uh, it captures the table and depicts it in a point cloud format on screen. Uh, mode two filters the point cloud based on preset color attributes. In this case, we have three. And this filtering allows the designer to have pre-assigned characteristic to the concept model already in the physical space. Uh, then we mo move to mode three, which allows the designer to actually select target point clouds for transforming the physical model boundaries. And based on a user-defined uh, intensity value, the autoencoder transforms the original point clouds towards a selected target point cloud which contain interiority and structural properties. And this is done with the autoencoder. 
And at the end, we have mode four here, which shows the final interpretation of the concept model. And at the moment, the outer encoder was trained on approximately 10,000 point cloud structures with specific geometric properties, uh, which can be applied to the captured boundaries through blending. And since the exhibition, the outer encoder was uh, improved for better performance. Yeah. So the workflow diagram on screen details the setup behind our first use case, Cloud R1 and how the free components build, capture, and inform are interlinked. So as mentioned before, it starts with the building. In this case, we are building with blocks. Uh, then we have the capture component, and this controls the resolution and segments the composition based on colors while offering visual feedback on screen. And finally, it ends with the component for informing the digitized raw point clouds uh, by utilizing the developed autoencoder and additional rendering techniques such as instancing, materials, and of course, rendering. And somehow the goal of the setup is to establish an almost instant design dialogue between physical model building and the trained data of the neural network through the support of capturing devices and a point cloud notation. And the hope is that we somehow create an immediate feedback loop between a human and a machine intelligence while introducing a sort of hybrid immediacy that reintegrates physical model building at the center of a digital focused design process. So what is next for our research group? Um, so the capturing component, we are, we are further developing and it now actually functions as an independent module which can calibrate and combine several Kinects and their point clouds into a shared coordinate system while working at a scale from 50 to six, 50 centimeters to six meters and if anyone is interested, we are, of course, happy to share the code as well. Uh, we're also working to improve the outro encoder further. Uh, we're working on enhancing its ability to inform our build models in a more beneficial way, both with regards to structural patterns and interiority. And in the future, we will actually start working on integrating uh, images in order to inform these point clouds based on their characteristics. And last but not least, we are also looking to integrate and test the workflow as part of design studios to get, to get feedback and, of course, also to develop the workflow uh, further. And uh, for those who are interested, uh, there's more information on our current wor workflow on these two posters, which you can find in the exhibition. Uh, one details the current state of the encoder, uh, and it has a much more technical breakdown of uh, of the math and the, the computation behind it. Uh, and another, our first use case, uh, Cloud 1.0. And you can find those in the exhibition space, where you also, of course, have the chance to try the setup yourself, as you can see here, uh, since we brought an in-progress version of the workflow and, in, and have it installed here at the exhibition. Uh, and somehow, when all that is set, we are now in the process to develop the next Cloud use case, which we uh, originally called Clouder 2.0, uh, which extends and completes our workflow by linking the digital back to the physical. And we're doing this together with another uh, uh, sub-project within the SFB project, so with SFB 9. And we're working on printing, on a printing addition to the pipeline that somehow aims to materialize our digitally informed, uh, or our machine informed digital point clouds from Cloud One, and to somehow test a method uh, for printing these. And we already did this at a workshop in Graz in last May, and we'll hold one in Stuttgart in the next month. So we're very much looking forward to this. And yeah, with this slide, I would just like to end this short presentation and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Matthias. Um, does anyone have any questions for Matthias? Yes. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Vasnes Pekovic from University of Navi Sad. I would like to ask you, uh, this work workflow, uh, going from physical model to uh, the point cloud and then some kind of a modeling and then extracting uh, data from that, uh, it would be really suitable, for example, for more complex geometries like uh, developable surfaces or something like that. So 
if you wanted to apply this workflow, for example, for a sheet of uh, material, which you can uh, uh, model physically and uh, make point clouds, for example, by using photogrammetry or laser or what you, uh, whatever, whatever you use to make point clouds, and then maybe to get some feedbacks uh, about uh, the digital model, which is uh, surveyed from that physical sheet. Would you have to adapt this workflow or you can use the same workflow you, you used for these blocks? No, I mean, of course, the Kinex can scan anything at this point. So, I mean, we just use blocks as a starting point uh, for primarily for the installation, but we're looking for you to essentially be able to use any found object that you have at your disposal. So you could put your coffee cup in, you could crumble your piece of paper if you think that's a great starting point for you, anything. It could also be that you want to model with clay and you could live sculpt the thing and then you could get a digital uh, suggestion for how this, this could look uh, in terms of being informed by a new or like uh, our auto encoder network and somehow restructure these points um, and then if you are, for example, you see it on screen and you maybe think that half of it looks really exciting, but maybe you want to change the other half, then you could just immediately add some more clay maybe and somehow get it to, so you could have this kind of continuous dialogue with it. And of course that could uh, yeah, work with any material. some kind of optimization into this, uh, this uh, kind of process. Yeah, I mean, our hope is that it will work as a really as a back and forth. So you are more having a dialogue with the network and it's a very live dialogue that essentially happens instantaneously. So you also get informed by your decision making or your design uh, decisions by what you see from the network and then you change what's on the table. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. So let's move on to the next presentation by uh, Julian York. And uh, I think Julian will be um, talking a bit more about these new clay-based materials and how to 3D print them. Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone also from my side. Many thanks for the invitation. Many thanks for the introduction also to Michael. Uh, I'm PhD student and project assistant and teacher at the Institute of Architecture and Media at TU Graz. And on behalf of my colleagues, PhD colleagues Lukas Gosch, and Hanna Vashatko, as well as our project leader, Milena Stravich, over there, I would like to present one of our outcomes of our research project from SP9. As part of the whole SFB project, we are the ones following a rather quite experimental approach, a very material-based and also uh, with a focus on digital manufacturing, producing hands-on prototypes. All of that with the aim to increase the usability of sustainable building materials in architecture. Uh, my talk today will be a presentation on experimental shaping methods of clay composites using the example of, we named, uh, of what we named Mycera. Mycera, short for mycelium and ceramics, is a composite material made of inorganic and organic parts. As an inorganic part, we're using clay, and as an organic part, mycelium, which is the vegetative part of mushrooms, so the, the roots, you could say. And mycelium is a renewable raw material, and just like clay, it's very environmentally friendly. Our scientific contribution is to combine, on the one hand, digital manufacturing, so allowing for complex uh, material distributions within geometries, and together with natural growing fiber materials like mycelium, in order to use their ability of growth for strengthening the tensile strength or other qualities in the built element. Just like all of our projects, actually, this research was conducted in four phases. First, material composition. Second, testing and analysis. Third, setting up hardware and software. And finally, fourth, building a case study. But of course, this is always a very iterative process, as all of you know, of course. 
until we came up with a really case study in the end. The main challenge in the material composition phase was finding an optimal substrate type as well as an optimum ratio of the substrate to clay, so of organic and inorganic material, following two requirements. So on the one hand, we aimed for maximizing the organic material in the mixture to achieve enough nutrition for an even mycelial growth and for a greater effect of these fibers. But on the other hand, we had to use as much of clay as possible in order to make sure that the mixture has the right viscosity and elasticity necessary for 3D printing. We then developed a series of material mixtures. Um, in the end, a weight ratio of seven parts clay and one part sawdust was proven to be most viable for further experiments. Starting the material testing phase with this mixture, to evaluate the increased strength of the printed layer connections, uh, we prepared samples in cylindrical form. They were then dried, sterilized. Half of the samples were inoculated with mycelium, again dried, and then sanded down to have all identical dimensions. And the test results confirmed our hypothesis of strengthening via these living fibers and show an increase of average of maximum tensile strength by 32% with in the printed layers, so from one printed layer connection to the next one, which usually doesn't matter if clay or PLA or concrete is a weak spot for 3D printing. In the next step, we tested the tensile strength along the axis of extrusion, so in that case, horizontally. And also here with the same process, half of them were inoculated and compared. And here, uh, the test results even show an increase of average of maximum tensile strength by 66%, which was quite a lot, and we're very, very happy about that. Always, of course, in favor for specimens with mycelial growth. Further, uh, in the next series of examples, we, we developed material samples with ranging wall thicknesses of clay, so ranging from 2.5 to 9.5 millimeter, in order to see what's the maximum wall thickness mycelium could grow through and penetrate. These were all 3D printed, and after 14 days of mycelial growth, we broke pieces out of them and investigated them under a light microscope. And as you can see here, this is one clay war, and the white foam on the left-hand side is superficial mycelial growth. So these fibers are really so small that they're more like a, a foam. And on the right-hand side, even with greater magnification, you can see the clay wall and mycelium after it's penetrating the wall, reaching for nutrients. And this was for us the evident that uh, even clay walls with a maximum diameter of 9.5 millimeter could be penetrated. As we wanted to further investigate what's going on here, we even took a closer, so a, a very much closer look on what's happening inside within the clay particles and the high fee. High fee are the very, 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 very small fibers of this high fill network of roots of mushrooms. So on this scale, again, mycelial growth, we can see it here. On the left-hand side, that's uh, clay minerals and organic substrate. On the right-hand side, on an even smaller scale, you can see these oval cavities here, which exactly correspond to the diameters of these high fees. And for us, this was evident, so to, to summarize what's evident, uh, mycelium is capable of partially penetrating inorganic components, such as clay, in its search for nutrients. With this knowledge, we then took the next step and redefined the software and hardware setup for producing the final case study. A custom software plugin was written in Grasshopper to generate all necessary machine data within Rhino. And this is also the, the standard software setup we are working and designing in. And with this, we've been able to finally produce all of the following designs, as you can see in the last picture. In order to design a structure that somehow reflects the possibilities of which resulted from these newly gained material qualities, 
but also from digital fabrication, a so-called combined structure was developed. The structure was then assembled by putting two types of elements together. So one element based on clay, one element based on mycelium, but both containing these organic material for allowing growth. On the left-hand side, you can see a digital picture of the combined structure. To visualize the mycelial growth, so the white foam here, we used a metaball algorithm, and this algorithm is usually characterized by its ability uh, once you have multiple curves. Once they're closed uh, in proximity, they melt together to form contiguous objects, and this just helped us for visualizing of what we proposed going to happen as the threshold of this melding uh, process was set by further experiments on how far this hyphae would reach out in mid-air. On the right-hand side, you can see a picture of the final combined structure in real life, so to say. You can see the two elements, node elements based on mycelium, bar elements based on clay. And in fact, as proposed, the mycelial connections were ably, uh, able to really structurally connect bar and node elements as these mycelium fibers of the still growing elements uh, formed connections through expansion of this hyphal network and then what we call bio-welded the elements together. Under usual atmospheric condition, the growth of mycelium stops so it just dries after about two to three days. As we always aim to make our research open to public as well, we built a 2.5 meter high column made from this material as, so to say, as a proof of concept, which consists of 80 of these uh, 3D printed clay bricks, which are then filled and assembled again with a substrate of bleached cellulose and mycelium and it was exhibited at Steiermark Schau in Graz Kunsthaus back in April 2021. Further, since September 2021, material samples as well as printed prototypes and also some digital media showing the production process, so like um, time-lapse videos of the growing process as well. Uh, this is all exhibited at Ars Electronica Center in Linz, among with other bio-based materials. And with these pictures, I'd already like to close today's presentation. I would invite you to have a look at the exhibition over there, as you all also can see some of the example pictures I've shown in the presentation, and feel free to touch them, maybe a bit gently, as you know. If you're interested, on further information, I can invite you also to visit our website for collaborations with other SPs, exhibitions, and publications as well. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Julian. Um, do we have any questions for Julian? All right, then. What is there? So far, it's meant to be for indoor use, but we are also developing coatings for this mycelium. But for now, it's indoor use, yeah? Or filling of then to be outdoor materials. I wonder if it is possible to further customize these structures by guiding the mycelium in certain direction using an internal structure or maybe some other clues like mm -hmm. attracting them by nutrients or something like that. Yeah, luckily the mycelium can be guided quite easily by placing nutrients on certain areas. That's why we also had these two elements. As we know that the node elements containing a lot of nutrition will be an attractor point for this mycelial growth. And we also further developed multi-material, so we are currently writing on that paper, but multi-material printing uh, where we can specially uh, specifically print clay and nutrients to then somehow guide the growth, yes. Great idea.
All right. Uh, thank you, Julian. So with this, you, um, let's move on to the final presentation of this session. And it will be given by uh, Kumar Sharif Mogadam, and he will talk about how to design transformable surfaces. Yeah, so thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, David, for the introduction. I'm going to present you uh, flexible trapezoidal quad surfaces for transformable design, or the way I read a complicated title, such as this one, uh, some mathematical stuff for some kind of design. But um, to make it a bit more sophisticated, the most challenging part, as uh, we heard in the first uh, talk by Mr. William Baker, uh, is this four, right? The way uh, we connect uh, the theoretical stuffs, in our case, uh, geometry to the application. And this is what we have done in the past few years. So with this team, um, we started from the abstract theories uh, and worked our way to the application in design. Um, so transformable, kinetic, deployable, flexible, adaptable, deformable, and foldable. These words, and definitely more of them, uh, can have the same or different meanings depending on the context and uh, your point of view. Yet they are all referring to structures, buildings, furniture, and so on with movable parts or components associated with a shape change. Transformable design often known for being static, sustainable, multifunctional, transportable, adaptable, and interactive. Now, among the all possible classifications, one is uh, geometric. Uh, discrete surfaces of planar rigid quad faces and rotational joints with the topology of a disk and combinatorics of a regular grid are in general rigid but there are some classes uh, which are flexible and they're only having one degree of freedom, which makes them suitable for design with controlled movement, such as this very nice example um, of, uh, this is what we call flexible quad surface. In this case, this is a faux surface designed by Mr. William Baker, who gladly is here today and uh, gave this very nice talk in the morning. Um, you see the installation, um, and uh, so the next class uh, for us, the first class we studied, uh, which is another class of tra um, quad, uh, flexible quad surfaces, is this class trapezoidal surfaces, um, which uh, in the discrete case we call them tehedra, and in smooth case, we call them T-surfaces. I will explain the construction and deformation for uh, every case of discrete, uh, discrete analog, and always there is a corresponding smooth analog to all of them. Well, T-hedra uh, can be seen as a generalization of discrete surface of revolution, not the whole 360 rotation, but up to some point that, uh, to make sure it is still open because when we close it and, and glue the two ends together, it will be rigid. The result is isometrically deformable, meaning all the faces remain flat and rigid, and only the dihedral angles between the faces will change. Uh, for the construction, uh, we take a planar profile curve, or polyline, uh, here in dark blue, uh, lying on an orthogonal plane to a base plane, and we rotate it around an axis normal to the base plane here, parallel to the z-axis. And by multiplying a stretching factor on each step of rotation, we get a new trajectory instead of a circular arc a circular arc, and D 
depending on how we choose the trajectory polyline or curve uh, on, these, on the base plane here uh, in purple, it's the trajectory, we end up with a different surface. Or we can rotate as usual, regularly, but also change the position of the axis of rotation on each step along another polyline here in red to obtain a molding surface or mesh. And we can apply both at the same time to the, the result would be uh, what we call here a profile affine mesh. Finally, we can keep the profile and trajectory, those two curves, uh, or polylines, and only translate the profile along the trajectory to get a translational mesh. Mathematically, this means we are still rotating the profile, but around an axis in infinity. Uh, the main theoretical contribution of our team to this topic and within this project was the computation of the explicit formulas for construction and isometric deformation of all types of this class, both in a smooth and discrete analogs. And the most important step towards the application of such surfaces, which became our goal, was to, uh, was to implement the a tool to provide the design space for the designers to be able to construct and visualize this class. Therefore, we developed a plugin for Rhino Grasshopper, which is widely being used among the uh, designers and architects. Uh, its name is Scute. Scutes. Scutes uh, is a plugin with a main component which uh, takes two boundary curves and the list of directions to compute the other curve, the red one, then constructs a mesh and shows the deformed mesh only by changing a deformation parameter with a number slider. We have also added features and other components to ease the pre and post processes for fabrication. Having a design tool in our hands opened the doors for collaborations. This is the first prototype with cardboard and laser cut wooden plates, uh, which our colleagues in uh, TU Graz fabricated. Also this mock-up in a larger scale with wooden plates and metal hinges. As an example of a feature, uh, those curves and slits uh, are rails for additional guidance of the movement. And they've been generated by our plugin with a component that fixes an arbitrary edge, gives an access to the user to fix uh, an edge on the ground and shows the relative motion and computes those curves. In another collaboration with Rupert Malacek from University of Innsbruck, who is also here today, we have implemented a fully automatized process starting from two or three curves, resulting ready to print developed strips of faces. And as you can see and examine in the exhibition room, the hinge system, which we found the most challenging part of the design, works smoothly and with one degree of freedom movement. Now, what are the other two with bent strips? Bent strips. Well, we were curious about semi-discrete cases, where one boundary curve is smooth and the other one is discrete. Both semi-discrete stations consist of developable strips, which is really important for fabrication, where the rulings can be seen as the limit of one set of edges, which makes, again, uh, the prototyping easier. This is the initial state of each, type, of each type, and when we change the deformation parameter, there are always flexion limits. Vertically, where a column gets flat, and horizontally, when, uh, where a go gets flat. Back to the models, here is the equilibrium state of H, because the bending energy function is monotonic, and is minimum in the flexion limit, where at least one of these strips gets flat, they look different. Uh, and the advantage of this design is we use a unified hinge system for all of them and put the ruling slits, we've put them, to give more flexibility to the models. Another question would be, can we change the topology to a cylinder out of curiosity, and there is application for that, for sure, 
like this one. In the beginning, I mentioned that by closing the trajectory curve, we get a rigid mesh. But can we have flexible mesh with closed profile curve that remains closed while we deform it, not like the left one, but like the one on the right side? The answer is yes, but not in general. The profile curve needs to fulfill some conditions. Um, and I'm not going through that, those conditions, but we can generalize the idea to semi-discrete cases and or even the smooth tube. Uh, here's how they deform. And well, inspired by the works of Tachi, Paulino, and Filipov on rigid foldable and flat foldable tubular origami structures, we generalize the idea in several aspects. Here you see all possible cross sections uh, or profiles of such tubes, which are deltoid, parallelogram, and antiparallelogram. The, uh, the one on the right side, antiparallelogram, has interesting complicated topology as well when we avoid the self intersections. And uh, well, why these tubes are important? Because we can repeat and connect the tubes to obtain sandwich-like structures or metal materials like this one, which consists of bent faces as well. This is a uh, new version, one of the uh, generalizations. And if you're a fan of Escher's tessellation, like myself. Um, so far, the connections uh, were always on a row of faces and with aligned edges, so having the, sharing the uh, same base plane. But we can connect the tubes uh, in a rotated way when the base planes uh, are not parallel anymore. It's called a zipper coupling and makes this structure much stiffer, like this one. It's flat foldable, and when the two ends come together, uh, gets really stiff. Also this one in my hands, which has um, programmable minimum and maximum lengths, and also programmable stiffness. And finally, just a few weeks ago, we found the first non-translational example of flexible zipper couplings uh, with configurable cross-section. And that's uh, almost this, as a bonus, <laughs> this tower bridge, what I call. We already moved to the next class for surfaces, like uh, Mr. Baker's design, and hopefully we extend the plugin with other classes in the future. Uh, thank you, We're looking forward to the questions. Great, thank you, Kumars. Are there any questions for Mars? Yes. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, because we were looking into reconfigurable structures for quite some time, and uh, the challenge is actually the scaling up to building scale. Yes. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, yeah, thanks for asking that. Uh, well, uh, if I had more time, I was going to also uh, include some slides on the uh, spectrum of the works we have done. So we started from very abstract and theoretical parts and up to the, the mock-ups with the help of others. And our, the, one of the future projects is to scale it up. Uh, for me personally, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on that specific area, but as uh, Mr. Baker showed me an uh, example of failure in this kind of uh, designs, there are so many technical issues that could happen and pops up when you're starting, I know about that. Uh, well, our, yeah, the main contribution was to provide the geometry and visualize it better. Uh, we added some features for, for example, for uh, 
uh, transmit to, to show the transmission of the force through the net or the bending energy on the semi-discrete cases. But uh, in real life and in a larger scale, I don't know what happens. Uh, we need to uh, collaborate more with others and uh, see. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank so, you. if there, yes, one more question. It's more, <coughs> it's more of a comment than a question, but also following up on what Henrietta said. Uh, uh, yes, we should think about how to scale it up, but we can also scale it down. So we have sort of worked on a little bit on metamaterials and related systems, and sometimes the success story is in a very, very small scale. So we have collaboration with medical researchers who, who look at what, what can, can happen to the interventions inside our bodies. And so that sometimes that's where the kind of application areas lie. So I would just suggest to be very open-minded about the scale issue, big or small. Either of those are, those are all valid questions, but, but the thickness will hit you when you go really big, right? That's when geometry and kind of the reality of construction will sort of create very interesting constraints and, and new challenges. So, but yeah, great exactly. work. Thank you. Yeah, that, that for, uh, thanks for making that point because I was, yeah, it, it, this is what happens when you have a short time. I, I was going to include some slides as well uh, regarding the different, the spectrum of the scales from, for example, uh, tubular structures uh, in, in blood veins to the very large scale uh, solar panels of the um, satellites and shuttles, these kind of things. Um, so, yeah, I guess the, the, the best if, if you're not going to uh, really um, engage with the uh, hinge system, going to get engaged with that, with the hinge system and, and these kind of things in fabrication, it's better to keep it in uh, rather smaller uh, scales like in, in interior design, uh, furniture like structures, these kind of things. But thank right. you. Thank you, Kumars.